Hi, it's the Tropical Tidbit for Saturday evening, August 24th. As always, the thoughts here are mine alone, and in making decisions, consult the National Hurricane Center and your local weather office. Well, we're deep in the heart of the hurricane season now. It's taken some time for us to get some activity, uh, but we do have some areas to watch this weekend and next week. Uh, we're watching uh, one area in the northwestern Gulf, one area off the southeastern U.S. coast, and a newly formed tropical storm, Dorian, east of the Caribbean. We'll talk about all of these starting from left to right. Let's talk about Invest 90L first in the northwestern Gulf of Mexico. This is a wave that came out of the Caribbean and has been moving northward toward the Gulf Coast over the last several days. And it's a rather disorganized feature and the uh, vorticity maximum that was out over water this morning has actually moved inland at this point. And there's an area of spin here. There is some loose troughiness down to the south as well with a mid-level vorticity maximum left over from a big area of thunderstorms that went off the this morning and uh, had this thing spinning pretty well on radar in the mid-levels. Uh, as the daytime convection over land has fired this afternoon, uh, the oceanic convection is decaying. Tomorrow morning we might get another burst of it, uh, but again the main low-level center is actually over land now, and so chances for this system to develop are pretty low, and this is mainly expected to be just a rainmaker for areas of the west central Gulf Coast, so of course keep an eye out for localized flash flooding in some spots potentially. Okay, so that's 90L. We now have a system that we're watching east of Florida. This has been coming up through the Bahamas and sort of gradually turning toward the north here. Pretty loose looking system uh, and uh, some shear. You can see some upper level clouds moving from west to east here. And it, it's kind of hard to even define the low level structure of this. There was an old low that moved over south Florida and kind of just died here. Uh, the mid-level low is over here somewhere and this is moving slowly northeastward and this is likely to develop a new low level center at some point in the coming days and uh, most modeling does expect some sort of low to form here and move off to the toward the northeast now you can see that this jet stream is uh, racing right through here uh, off of the Carolinas and this is going to steer this thing well offshore so this is not a concern for the southeastern US coast or anything like that but this is going to come up and could potentially get close to Canada in a few days we'll have to see this is the European model 500 millibar forecast for Tuesday morning so this is in three days showing the system here in the mid-levels this is a tropical storm strength low on the model at this point and the two key features here are this upper low near Nova Scotia and the big trough coming into the northern U.S. and uh, coming eastward. So the flow is roughly parallel to these black contours, and so you can see the jet stream is like this, again, trying to steer this thing toward the northeast. Now, there is a chance that when this upper low exits out and this trough digs in a little bit over New England, that it could rotate this up sort of close to southeastern Canada somewhere. It's possible. It's also very possible it just remains over the open water and and even if it does get close to Canada, it would be weakening due to the colder water north of the Gulf Stream. But historically, Canadian storms are pretty strong at landfall if they move north of the Gulf Stream because they're moving quickly. So it's worth watching in case it comes up that way. But if it does, it'll be several days from now yet. Plenty of time to watch this one if you're up in southeast Canada. All right, so that's 98L. We also have newly formed Tropical Storm Dorian in the Central Atlantic. This is a low that's been trekking westward within the monsoon trough and is now just a few days from the Lesser Antilles and has closed off into a well-defined circulation. If we look at the uh, satellite floater here, transitioning to shortwave infrared as the sun sets at the latter part of the loop, we'll see this thing is clearly rotating and it has a small area of moderate thunderstorm activity. It's not crazy. Uh, but it is enough for this to be upgraded to a tropical storm. Now, if we go straight to the water vapor loop, we'll see that this is one of those pretty small storms here that's trying to develop within a large region of dry air and sinking or subsidence. Um, this is because planet planetary scale wave activity is favoring large scale sinking in the Atlantic in general. And so this is a pretty dry zone and a pretty suppressed zone for convection. Uh, but Dorian is giving a go at it, and once you get a circulation going, it can start sustaining its own convection over time. The downside to that, for the storm anyway, is that it can start drawing in dry air from the environment, and it can start choking that convection off. And so you're seeing little pulses of convection, nothing really solid and persistent, but more like showers popping up uh, over and over again repeatedly, trying to keep a little bit of a moist pocket around the low center. Now, if we identify the areas of really dry air, that's going to be the darker grays, such as this that you see here in the mid-levels showing up here. And then you'll also see underneath the cirrus to the west of Dorian uh, some 
dry air showing up in here as well. And uh, this could eventually get wrapped into the circulation with time, uh, but you'll see that these two dark gray regions aren't impinging on the storm center and we have a fairly moist pocket where Dorian center is right now with this lighter gray tone underneath the cirrus. So it's not getting completely suppressed by dry air but you can see this area of darker gray in the path of the storm as it moves into it over the next few days. So that is the large suppressing factor. We've had a little bit of easterly shear in the last couple days that's now lightening. Shear will become no issue as this approaches the islands but it will uh, become an issue again after uh, the storm moves into the eastern Caribbean and the reason for that is if we look at the GFS forecast for the upper level flow on Tuesday morning we'll see a large uh, tut cell or upper, le upper level trough uh, developing over uh, the greater Antilles bringing southwesterly wind flow over the eastern Caribbean and there's Dorian moving through the Windward Islands on this particular model this would be a lot of wind shear being imparted on a storm moving quickly out of the east and this would likely cause especially a smaller storm to really suffer moving into the eastern Caribbean and a lot of models have this coming into the eastern or central Caribbean and just dying because there's too much shear and dry air for the storm to overcome. Now there is some subtlety to this kind of forecast. One is that global models will tend to have small storms like this too weak. You can see the GFS is at 1008 millibars here at the islands. Given that shear is not going to be an issue until this point, and it's only dry air that Dorian is fighting, chances are it's going to be a stronger storm when it makes it to the islands. Because once you get that circulation going, it can maintain its own moist pocket. The big problem is when there's shear that forces the issue and forces the dry air into the circulation, and then it can't maintain that moist pocket anymore. So what it's trying to do is just keep firing these thunderstorms and moisten this up, and if it maintains this little area of moisture that it's creating for itself by getting moisture off the ocean and throwing it upwards into the atmosphere, then it will be able to likely maintain itself on its way to the islands and probably strengthen a bit as it does so. This dry air will periodically get pulled in, but as long as there's not a lot of strong shear, the storm will survive. Now once the shear picks up here, this becomes a different story. So again, when this enters the Caribbean and the shear picks up, whether it survives does depend on how strong it is, and that's why it's subtle, because if the GFS here can be assumed to be too weak, if it shows the storm dying, well, that might not happen. If the storm is strong enough, say it's a hurricane in the eastern Caribbean, it will survive for longer, and that will become uh, relevant for the greater Antilles, say uh, Hispaniola and Puerto Rico, down the line, days four and five, uh, middle part of next week, because a stronger storm will A, be moving farther north, and B, be more likely to survive to get to these islands and cause severe impacts. So we're going to be watching very carefully how strong Dorian is on approach to the islands, obviously. Now if we move this forecast forward by about another day, the other point that's subtle is that when Dorian arrives and what latitude it's at will matter a lot in relation to this upper level trough because you can see there's a couple of upper level lows here within the trough and there's a little bit of a break between them and if we go out one more day we'll see that the upper low uh, here is moving over Hispaniola, the other upper low lagging here. There's a little bit of a gap between the two, and if Dorian, say, is a little stronger and a little farther north, maybe passing near or north of Puerto Rico at this time, you could see a track where it sneaks sort of in between these two upper level lows to its left and right, and if a scenario like that were to come to pass, then the storm would have less shear over top of it as this upper low backs away and brings southeasterly flow aloft over the storm. And then if this is sneaking north of Hispaniola, it avoids the mountains, and you're talking about a storm in the southwestern Atlantic that long term, later next week, might be able to survive and uh, perhaps uh, be something to watch down the road. We see this in some of the ensemble guidance because the members in the European model, for instance, here from the Weather Nerds website, the northerly members are stronger and when they make it to the north of the Caribbean they see lower shear presumably and end up being stronger at the end whereas the majority of members that are weaker and farther south end up seeing the storm just dying even before it gets to Hispaniola or after moving into the area. So there's some subtlety here with how strong the storm is and how far north it goes and whether it could still survive to linger later we'll have to see. Completely too early to talk about that yet but it's one of the scenarios that could happen long term and so it's worth mentioning. For now, 
the current official forecast out to five days, which is more than far enough, out to next Thursday shows the storm strengthening, becoming a hurricane near the Lesser Antilles, and then continuing toward the Dominican Republic or Puerto Rico uh, by Wednesday and Thursday, and expected to have winds of about 85 miles per hour at that time. There's probably lower than normal confidence in this forecast because, again, we're dealing with a tiny storm. Tiny storms are easy to weaken, and they're also easy to intensify, so it by default makes it harder to forecast them. We have competing factors. Shear is going to be low during this part of the journey, but dry air will be lingering. The interplay, you know, how much will the dry air affect the storm? Going to have to see, but right now intensification of some sort seems like a good bet. Once it gets to the islands, a new struggle uh, comes to the storm in the form of increased shear in the Caribbean. How much will that affect the storm in the Caribbean? It'll depend a lot on where the storm is, how far south or how far north is it could play a role. So we'll be watching all those factors we just talked about. This is obviously a time for the Lesser Antilles to get prepared. Again, as, as usual, it's the drill. These are tiny islands and this is a tiny storm. So which island in particular could get impacted the most by Dorian will depend on very subtle changes in the track as we go along in the next few days. So we can't really pick out islands just yet, but the island chain will get the storm at some point, um, currently expected on Tuesday. So we'll keep an eye on Dorian as it comes west-northwest. Again, we have 98L that could become a storm and move northeastward across the northwestern Atlantic over the next few days. And we have this disturbance near the northwest Gulf Coast, which is not expected to develop, but is bringing rain to Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, and Arkansas over the next day or two. That's it for today. Thanks for watching.